church. Hello, church. Extraordinary men and women went before us with unmatched resilience, enduring hardship, when called upon to defend and liberate. They said yes. They found courage to rise with every son, loyalty toward their country, discipline for every command, even in the darkest hours, they said yes. They cherished and fought for freedom, so those coming behind them were assured of it. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be written, they said yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor them saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. Hey, I was just reading the Alameda Sun newspaper this week and I kind of had the impression that we older people would have more difficulty with the uh, uh, electronics and electronic communication, uh, like Zoom meetings and and uh, doing online kind of uh, uh, classes. I was wrong. Let me read this little story to you. The title of it is School Year Truncated. Monday, May 18th, Alameda School Board announced that online instruction would be shortened by six days, so they're stopping the semester early. Stopping in May instead of going through June. 79.8% of the teachers voted to end the school year now. They said given the circumstances, it was a fair decision. That's uh, one of the, an English teacher at the high school. It said virtual attendance, and work completion was down. Sadly, very few students actually fully participated in distance learning. So they're ending it and then the teachers will just uh, use that time to, to uh, prepare for the new school year. I was kind of surprised at that. Well, a lot of things about this uh, pandemic uh, era that we are in are very surprising, but I want to look in God's Word today. Many people are afraid. There's a lot of fear. And uh, the passage, which happened to be just the next passage I was to look at in uh, preaching through the book of Luke, talks about fear. And I've called this message courage or fear. Both. Both. We need both. And it's Luke chapter 12, the first seven verses. When Jesus was living here on this earth, the Pharisees and the scribes were the official uh, acknowledged religious leaders. And their main and greatest responsibility was to lead people to the Messiah. Help people find and know the promised Redeemer. Well, that person was Jesus Christ. But no, they were the ones who had hardened their hearts. They were the ones who were spiritually dead. And as a result, they misled the masses of people. They actually prevented people from finding new life in Jesus. And that's a warning to spiritual leaders today. Uh, those of us today who need, actually need to feel and know the same thing. We need to lead people to Jesus. We should not mislead people. And the master rightly uh, rebuked those religious leaders of New Testament times, and he could do the same thing for us today. And while Jesus was dining with a Pharisee, a large crowd of people, it said maybe uh, thousands of people, gathered outside the home. Now there probably was a spirit of hostility in that crowd. The Pharisees and scribes had agitated the people, uh, helped kind of led them away from Jesus. 
And Jesus here in uh, Luke chapter 12 speaks, though, not to the thousands, but he speaks to the twelve. And he began teaching his disciples. I wonder if there's a lesson for us who are spiritual leaders, who are teachers, who are preachers. Maybe we should address the small group and be less concerned about the large groups, the crowds. Well, in this case, the crowd was not ready to receive what Jesus had to say, so he focused on the twelve. I do need to point out that as Jesus was talking to the twelve, he was speaking in a way that other people standing around could hear. Let's dig into those first 12 verses of Luke chapter 2. Verse one, uh, chapter 12, verse 1 says, In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Here, Jesus warns his followers about the corrupt spirit of the Pharisees. The word hypocrite originally meant someone who answers, and hypocrisy just meant answers or answering. Literally, it means underjudging. Now, then the term got associated with questions and answers in a play. And then it was the idea of acting a part, pretending. So finally, the most commonly accepted definition of hypocrite is someone who is not genuine. They're just play acting. Now, I believe God would rather have a blunt, honest sinner than someone who puts on an act of goodness, pretends to be good. The yeast metaphor would be a whole lot easier to, uh, uh, for the people there in that era to understand, more obvious to them in their time than ours. They usually made their own bread. Practically everyone did. And so they were familiar with how just a, a little bit of leaven or yeast transforms a large lump of dough. Leaven works very slowly, but it works constantly. And here, Jesus says the leaven is hypocrisy. And just as bad yeast corrupts bread, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees corrupts people. Verses 2 and 3. Verse 2 says, For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. You see, religious hypocrisy is not just sin. It is a useless attempt to hide the truth. Now, let's look at verses 2 and 3 of Luke chapter 12. Verse 2 says, For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will be not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. You see, religious hypocrisy is not just sin. It's a useless attempt to hide truth. And that's what these guys were doing. It can be truth about hidden sin. The idea of justice and judgment is uh, what is implied here. Uh, for example, if a crime is committed, we want the right person caught. We want that person uh, prosecuted. We want that person convicted, if that's the one who committed the crime. And the facts and the evidence are often hidden by the criminal. So truth needs to come out. I talked uh, last week about, you know, wearing the mask and uh, the, the bandanas and all, and, and how as I went out, uh, everyone always recognized me. Uh, I was, uh, uh, saw one of our uh, young adult church members yesterday had on a black mask. I knew who he was instantly. And I'd question in our last message, how do criminals get by with that? How do, how do they uh, put on a mask and then no one can identify them? Well, they have been trying it. Let me share this news story with you or part of it. Here's the title of it. Armed thieves are capitalizing on the fact that everyone is now wearing masks in public. Uh, Salomar Gonzalez had messaged her stepfather on Facebook. 
and uh, said, uh, said, Dad, can you get us some uh, surgical mask and some gloves? And he assumed that she wanted them, just like everybody else in the world right now, for protection against the coronavirus. However, the FBI says her boyfriend, uh, William, in fact, used the highly sought after protected gear to disguise his face and fingerprints during an eight day crime spree that ended with the couple's arrest. Now, under normal circumstances, walking into a store wearing a surgical mask in the US will be grounds for suspicion. But with practically everyone wearing some sort of face covering to avoid catching or transmitting this coronavirus, more Americans than ever are obscuring their features when they leave home. And the thieves have capitalized on this trend. Uh, one police uh, detective said, no one would be alarmed at this now compared to just a month ago. So we're in a different era here, uh, a, a time when uh, truth is obscured. People's faces are obscured and then some people take advantage of that. Well, truth will come out and needs to come out. That couple in that story, they were both arrested. They were found out. There's also truth about the Lord, whether Jesus is God or not. There's truth about salvation. How do we get it? How do we get saved? Truth about eternal life. Is it really forever? When does it start? Lots of questions, and there's truth to back up all of those uh, topics, those questions, those ideas. So there's positive truth as well as uh, sin truth. There's lots of spiritual truth and it's often hidden or ignored. In verses 2 and 3, Jesus is teaching here that truth will always come to light. Partly in this life, completely at the last judgment. And so nothing's going to be hidden. God knows it all. He already knows. And so we need not to be hiding things in our own lives. We can't hide it from God anyway. In fact, let me tell you this, it does not pay to play the hypocrite. Verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, and this is uh, Jesus speaking, he said, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Now, I want to talk about those two verses just a bit. Jesus starts off, remember he's talking to his disciples there, and he says, my friends, my friends. That's a further designation of disciple. It indicates a close personal relationship. It indicates an assurance of God's care for them. And Jesus is saying here, don't fear people. Yes, people can hurt you. People can kill the physical body, but the soul cannot be killed. And probably all of the original disciples, not counting Judas, died as martyrs, except for one. John lived uh, to old age. So these men he's talking to and said, don't, don't fear, don't fear people. They are going to face physical death because of their faith in Christ. Well, God's more powerful than any persecutor, and he won't forget you. He cares about you. We need to get our values straight. Fear of God seems to be out of style, yet it needs to be in style. It needs to be a part of our life. Do you focus on the fear of God, or should we be focusing on the love of God instead? Well, I say both. And let me explain a bit more about fear of God so that we can understand that and know that's something that needs to be a part of our walk with the Lord. I believe the fear of God is compatible with the love of God. All through the Bible, the fear of God is a necessary ingredient of right living. And really, it's an attitude. There are two parts to this attitude. 
first one is uh, parts of this, uh, it is parts of fear of God. The first one is recognize the greatness and the righteousness of God. That's a, more of, uh, of worship and adoration of our Lord. Recognize his greatness. Recognize how righteous he is. But the second part of the fear of God is acknowledging our readiness to sin. Now think about that for a moment. Our readiness to sin. It's pretty easy for us to do as uh, human beings. It's our nature, in fact. And so we need to acknowledge that and know that we need to be on guard so that we can keep our, our connection with God strong. You see, the fear of God and the love of God find their place in the right faith in God. Trust in Him. Be sure of this. God possesses all power for time and eternity. And He'll punish those who do evil. So that's why we don't have to be afraid of them. God will take care of those who uh, oppose Him. But be sure of this. Jesus wants to reassure His friends, not frighten them. He doesn't want to frighten us either. Let's look at verse 6 and then verse 7. Verse 6 says, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs, this is verse 7, Luke chapter 12, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value than sparrows. The fear of God in verse 5 is for Christians. We're to have reverence, uh, respect, honor for God. We are to worship Him. And now we need to add to that love for the Heavenly Father. Faith in the Heavenly Father. Why? Because He cares for us faithfully. Even for the least of His creatures, God cares. Luke says here, five uh, sparrows. Let's just put it in uh, money that uh, is more familiar uh, with us. Uh, uh, five sparrows for two cents. Matthew says two sparrows for one cent, one penny. So in Luke's telling of this, let's remember Matthew. What do we get? Two birds for one penny. Luke says five for two pennies. So it looks to me like you buy four, you get one free. They were doing marketing uh, way back then, just like people do today. But think about that free bird, that one that didn't cost anything. Does God care anything about that one? There's no value placed on it. It was just a gift. It was just an extra. I believe he does care. You can be sure God cares about the very least. He cares especially for you. God takes an interest in us. Even the most ins insignificant matters, God cares. Uh, I, I think it's a very detailed care that God has for us when he talks about the number of hairs on your head and and uh, caring for uh, little birds. Yes, it's very detailed. When I was in college at Oklahoma Baptist University, President Bill Tanner resigned to go take a job with our, uh, a mission board and be the leader of that organization. At a going away event, I had an opportunity to speak to him privately, and I told him that I might want to work for him after graduation. I was interested in the work of that mission board. And he said, you get a hold of me. And he said, I'll get you a pulpit and a piano. Well, I was kind of shocked. I knew that he knew I was a ministerial student, but I didn't know he knew I, that I knew how to play the piano. I was quite shocked at that and very pleased that the president of the university knew details about me enough to care. And uh, I was not a, a music major, 
but at some event he must have seen me do that. Well, God knows about us too. Even more details and he cares. We need to replace the fear of people with true and believing reverence for our Heavenly Father. You know, any, any movement toward hypocrisy just becomes irrelevant. It's useless because God knows. So don't pretend. Be who you are, but be who you are with Christ working in and through you. And just as the fear of God helps us overcome the fear of evil people, so also does trust in God's care. Notice again in verse uh, 7, uh, you're more value than the sparrows. God considers every person to have value. You're worth more than creatures. You're worth more than things of this world. And if you haven't already, you need to place your faith in Jesus. He's the one who finds value in your life. And in fact, he literally puts value into your life life. Jesus is the one who makes life worth living. And if you have fears in your life, if you uh, feel like you don't have a uh, relationship or maybe not a good relationship with the Lord, I would encourage you to uh, check out our website at Central Baptist Church. It's centralalameda.org and uh, use the connect button and send a message to us. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, if there's some spiritual help that I can provide, uh, encouragement, um, as well as any kind of, uh, perhaps some kind of uh, physical ministry that you might need, please contact us. I'd love for you to do that. We don't know yet when we will be reopening for public worship. I know that may be uh, coming sooner than we had thought it was going to, but still things are up in the air and take some more preparation for that. So I do appreciate those who are listening. I just read a, a, a part of an article this morning that said that fewer and fewer people are tuning in to the online worship now as they were uh, nearly uh, two months ago. But that's not been the case uh, for our channel. And so I appreciate uh, all of you who do uh, watch the messages that we have on uh, our website and uh, show up on YouTube and Facebook as well. So I encourage you to contact us. We don't have a way to really contact each one or know who is watching. But if you have a need, please go to centralalameda.org and connect with us. Let me pray for you real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your wonderful blessings to us for caring about every detail of our lives and wanting us to have the very best lives. Lord Jesus, you said that you want us to have an abundant life, a life that is full, a life that is of value and worth. And Lord, help us to experience that. Lord, be with those who may be listening that have some real serious needs in their lives. Maybe there's some fear that needs to be overcome. Lord, help them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.